Hi friends, welcome to Fertility Friday q and I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford and today we're answering some of your fertility questions. Hi there, this is Fertility Q&A. So we're gonna be answering some of your top fertility questions. I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford, I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, and I'm here to help you learn more about your fertility. Please subscribe to the channel if you are interested in supporting our message of getting fertility related information to more people. I also have a natural fertility program called Enhance Your Natural Fertility. If you're interested in learning more in a progressive, organized fashion with community support and Q&As about how to get pregnant naturally or optimize your chance of success with fertility treatments, you can learn more on my website, nataliecrawfordmd.com. Let's dive into some of your top fertility questions. These are all asked in the community tab or in the comments of this video. So if you have questions you want to be answered in the future, ask below or ask in that community tab. Let's go. All right, thank you so much for all you do. Could you talk about adenomyosis and how it can affect pregnancy and fertility? All right, adenomyosis is a really interesting thing and something that people don't talk enough about. Adenomyosis is a cousin. It's very similar to endometriosis. Endometriosis is where the endometrium or the lining of the uterus is found in places outside the uterus. So it's found on the surface of the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, the intestines, the peritoneal cavity. It causes high levels of inflammation and can contribute to infertility. Adenomyosis is where those endometrial implants are actually found in the myometrium or the muscular layer of the uterus. When this happens, it still does cause inflammation, but the fear is that it can cause problems with fertility or implantation later. Interestingly, adenomyosis is much more common in people who've had a pregnancy in the past. So we think it might be some part of the remodeling or the healing of the uterus that can contribute to this. You usually diagnose adenomyosis with imaging, so with an ultrasound or with an MRI, and it can cause symptoms like really heavy or painful periods. Unfortunately, if you find out you have adenomyosis, Often the best treatment is going to be IVF with suppression of the disease with medication called Lupron when it comes to embryo transfer. So not always, but if you're having infertility and we suspect you have adeno, that may be the recommendation to help you get pregnant again. All right, can you talk about low uterine lining? Understanding how the uterine lining grows throughout a cycle. Can getting off birth control have an impact? Things that can be done to improve or any additional information you may have. Okay. A thin uterine lining is something that can happen, and it is something that we worry about sometimes. When you have a thin lining, we usually find this on ultrasound worm monitoring. So first, some people have a thin lining, they have no idea, and they get pregnant. Second, we do sometimes see a thin lining in somebody who's been on prolonged birth control pills or an IUD, specifically a progesterone-based IUD. These mechanisms with a constant daily exposure to progesterone can inhibit the growth of the lining, and you might need some time off before your lining fully recovers. If we think about what happens in a normal menstrual cycle, what happens is the body sends out hormones. So the brain sends out FSH, which gets a follicle to grow. As that follicle is growing, the egg inside is maturing and making estrogen. That estrogen grows the lining. It gets to its fluffiest point right around the time of ovulation. Then that same follicle heals and makes progesterone from the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is responsible for progesterone, and if there's not a pregnancy, it dies and progesterone levels drop and you bleed. But what happens in between is that that progesterone stabilizes the uterine lining and it can compact it down some. Daily exposure to progesterone inhibits estrogen, so it prevents the lining from ever getting to that thick place. Remember that the first half of your cycle is a normally estrogen dominant phase. And so during that phase, we expect that your lining is getting to its top potential. If you have constant progesterone exposure, the lining is going to be thinner. That's one of the benefits of the IUD and the birth control pill. You don't bleed or you don't bleed as much, so you don't cramp as much, you're not as anemic. So some of the ways that it helps, but the longer you've been on it and prevented having that lining grow, it may take you a little bit to recover. Also history of prior uterine surgeries. So having a septum in the past, scar tissue in the past, multiple DNC procedures, having fibroids removed, those things also might damage the integrity of the uterus or make it harder for a lining to grow in the future. If I find somebody who has a very thin uterine lining, sometimes we talk about trying to induce ovulation and seeing if ovulating more than one follicle can have a higher natural estrogen load and can that help stimulate a better lining. So sometimes we will try ovulation induction, typically with letrozole over Clomid because a side effect of Clomid can be a thin lining. So that's one strategy. Another can be to try to do some natural things. Vitamin C and E can both be very beneficial to uterine lining. So can melatonin. Melatonin can actually help grow a lining. So I recommend patients take melatonin at night and extra supplements of vitamin C and vitamin E. 
We also want to think about if you have a chronically thin lining and we think that's an issue, do we need to do IVF so we can better synchronize the uterine lining and with the embryo? Not that we can do it in a fresh transfer, but sometimes we take the embryos out and we freeze them. And then we have the ability to get that lining to a thick place in a much longer time period than we would normally see in nature. So I'm able to sometimes even give injectable hormones, get that lining really thick, and then time the transfer. So the peak lining thickness in a frozen transfer cycle is not tied to when an egg is mature. And so that's a treatment strategy as well. It can be frustrating, but this is why I do recommend you come off hormonal birth control about three to six months before you're ready to conceive so you can see how your period pattern is and notice any abnormalities so you're not behind the game. My OBGYN says I have a tilted or retroverted cervix. Should I be worried about this when it comes to conceiving? My husband and I just started our TTC journey and I want your advice if this will impact us. Thanks for making knowledgeable content. It's my first go around TTC, so I'm trying to be proactive and learn as much as I can. Yay. Okay, what is a retroverted uterus? Okay, this question people ask all the time, and I know it's so confusing. The uterus, let's just think about your body. Let's pretend you're laying flat. If this is your body, and I have your cervix and your uterus. It can be in the mid plane, just like this. It can be antiverted, where it's tilted up towards your tummy. So cervix is down, uterus is up. Or it can be retroverted, where the uterus is going back towards your back and the cervix is pointed up. OBGYNs can't help but comment on this. It's like having red hair. Ooh, you have red hair. Half the reason we say it is because the uterus isn't in the normal spot when we go to look for it. Most people are mid or antiverted. That's just more normal anatomy. If you're retroverted, it's just a normal variant most of the time, just like antiverted can be a normal variant. So when we're going and we're putting a speculum in and your cervix isn't right there looking at us, but up or down, sometimes we'll say things like, oh, you have a tilted cervix or a retroverted uterus, and it does not impact your chance of getting pregnant naturally at all. Two important things. Sometimes history of prior C-sections can actually cause your uterus to be antiverted because it's scarred. So your uterus can get scarred up. So sometimes that can cause your body to have an introverted uterus. Another thing that can cause a retroverted uterus is sometimes endometriosis. Really bad endometriosis has a tendency to get in what we call the posterior portion of the uterus, so underneath it, and can scar your uterus towards the back. So even though a retroverted uterus is a normal variant, if it is that way and you have signs of endometriosis, like bleeding, pain with intercourse, uh, endometriosis cysts or chocolate cysts on your ovaries, or bad GI symptoms with your periods, we might want to do an investigation for endometriosis because sometimes you can see that with endo. So it does not impact your natural fertility unless there's an issue because it's reflecting another disease. How can we maximize the chance of success of an IUI? Opting for ovarian stimulation instead of following the natural cycle. Love your channel. Help me make informed decisions. Thank you. I love that. Okay. An IUI is an intrauterine insemination. This is where we're taking the sperm and we're putting it into the uterus. And I like to use the analogy, taking your players and moving them further down the field. How can you help this? Well, it depends on what's all going on. If you ovulate perfectly regularly and you're less than age 37 and you have just a mild male factor, so maybe the motility is not great, just doing an IUI in your natural cycle may be best. Or if you have absolute male factor, like you're using donor sperm because you want to be a single mom by choice or you're in a same-sex relationship, sometimes we just do your natural cycle. We follow that follicle, we let it ovulate or we trigger it, and then we time the insemination with your ovulation. However, if your ovulation is not perfect, you definitely want to combine it with ovulation ejection. So remember, a regular period should be one that comes regularly and predictably every month within one to two days. If you have a short luteal phase, you can't detect your ovulation or a lot of spotting in the luteal phase, we're concerned that's not perfect. But if your periods are like clockwork, you know you ovulate, then you probably aren't going to get any benefit. If they're off by some, then using an ovulation induction agent like Clomid or Letrozole will be helpful in improving your chances of conceiving. So that's something for you to think about is what is going to make the most sense there. Also, if your reason for doing the IOI is unexplained infertility, absolutely using an ovulation induction agent like Clomid or Letrozole and the IUI is the only way you get any benefit. Interestingly, in unexplained infertility, doing just ovulation like Clomid or Letrozole with intercourse or just an IUI does not improve your pregnancy rate at all. But when you combine them together, you do see a doubling of your pregnancy rate from what it would be without. So that treatment strategy can make sense. So the answer here is it depends on your scenario. And I guess the last thing is if you're over age 37, 
I often will recommend using an ovulation induction agent to try to get super ovulation. So trying to get more than one egg and put that sperm closer to where it needs to be because if most of your eggs are no longer genetically normal, I can expedite your time to pregnancy by trying to get more than one of them available for fertilization. What is the general consensus about starting anti-anxiety or depression medications during fertility treatments? I read somewhere that increased serotonin, if deficient to begin with, could help with egg quality. Is there any truth to that? Interestingly, studies are showing us that untreated depression or anxiety is worse for fertility than being on medication. And I think that should be a really important statement that you hear. This is for male factor and female factor. So if you have underlying depression or anxiety, you should not hesitate to get it treated. And we have patients who are on mental health medications throughout their entire fertility journey and pregnancy. You should have a mental health professional who is skilled in this helping guide you. Are you going to stop when you get pregnant or are you not? Everybody's situation is unique. But it does appear that it can improve your overall body and its inflammation levels and your egg quality. That it's likely due to part of the stress response. So having, you know, depression is stressful for your body. And so helping that with medication. We don't know if any of this is directly related to serotonin or not, but it definitely does not appear harmful for fertility to be on fertility medications when the alternative is to have untreated depression or anxiety. So again, always talk to your doctor about your scenario, but this is something that if my patients are on, I never take them off. I do not like switching up medications in a cycle that will result in a pregnancy. So I'm going to request my patients get stable on some medication before we get you pregnant because I don't want to be messing things up in an early pregnancy time when things are just really vulnerable. Okay, I hope these questions helped. Again, you can always ask your questions in the comments of the Q&A videos or in the community tab, and we will answer some of them every week on our Fertility Friday. Again, you can follow along on Natalie Crawford MD on Instagram, and you can always listen to the As A Woman podcast for more in-depth fertility-related information. Thanks, friends. <music>